so my, my background is actually geospatial science. So I basically do all the mapping for the core biologists. I'm actually a contractor for NOAA. Uh, and, and we basically help uh, map the, the coastal lines. And um, I'm also the FGNG ambassador for Team Life Below Water. And what that means, um, that's the Sustainable Development Goals. And that's part of the United Nations. And um, I'm talking directly from Miami, Florida. So if you're a, a local, say hi in the chat. We'd we'll love to um, uh, comment and, and let us know where you're from. Awesome, thank you. Um, and Scarlett's uh, formal bio intro. So geospatial scientist, social innovator, and co-founder of Unify IT uh, Inc., a global partnership company for CSR and CSI for the past three years. She's worked as an independent consultant for NOAA in geospatial technology. Uh, she's also, an, as she mentioned, ambassador for Sustainable Development Goals 14, Life Below Water, with the Social Impact Movement, a nonprofit delegate to bring global awareness set by the United Nations. And as I mentioned, a great supporter and friend of the Thousand Mermaids Artificial Reef Project. Uh, we're also very fortunate and grateful to have Mr. Stephen Rodan. Um, time is running out with our coral reef restoration and NASA engineer and MIT graduate Stephen Rodan gives us a first glimpse at his patented coral producing mechanism called CHARM, which is a coral husbandry automated raceway machine we'll explain a little bit later. Um, but without much further ado, I want to start off, uh, Scarlett, I'm sure everybody here has a, if they're joining us, has a, a little bit of an understanding about the, uh, of the issues plaguing our quarries. Well, why don't you give us a high, uh, you know, 100,000 foot level view uh, as to the current situation and, and the plight that our quarries are facing? Well, that's actually a really uh, good question to ask. Um, so that all depends on what location you are in the world. Um, I'm gonna mainly focus here in Florida um, just because I'm a local here as well and we have ample data in terms of the coral reef. But for one thing, why we're here and why we're discussing here in the States is because in, in Florida, we actually have the third largest coral reef in the world. Um, the first being in Australia, second in Belize, and we have the third. So therefore we need more um, information out to, to understand the coral reef and, to, and learn how to protect them um, through, uh, throughout the world um, and what's happening in our ocean. Why such a keystone species sh should we care? Why um, do people want to know about coral reefs? Um, besides being a, uh, in a booming economy for tourism, it's a, it actually serves a really big um, importance here um, as the keystone species. Think about corals as the rainforest of the sea. They actually provide oxygen um, to um, through a, a symbiosis relationship they, were, they have um, within the, the coral structure. And for this reason, um, it is one of the most important key features that we need uh, in order to sustain the, the life of a coral reef. Um, and more importantly, um, one of the main objective of having corals and why we should have an impact is because it being, let's say the rainforest of the sea, you know, if we don't, if they were to die, it would drastically affect how the ocean it balance and, and um, regenerate itself. Uh, remember, just like if we don't have trees on land without corals, then we're in big trouble. Just be mindful, 70% of the world, it is ocean. So if, if something were to happen to the ocean, it directly affects us. So without a doubt, a more importance and emphasis needs to be placed on the coral reefs in order to maintain the healthiness of the ocean entirely. The circle of life. It, you absolutely, can't absolutely. Interrupt so, one process will interrupt everything else. And uh, for those of you that don't know, there's thousands of species of fish that live and rely directly on our coral reefs. Um, if the corals die and they're not able to provide the habitat, for these thousands of species of fish, that's going to mess up what certain uh, predation fish and predators eat, and it just disrupts that circle of life. So we know that corals are out of sight, out of sight, out of mind for so many people that don't dive, that aren't marine biologists, but they literally could be the, the crucial element that allows you to keep eating the fish that you love. And there's so many other benefits that, that we'll get into as well. Um, Mr. Rodan, uh, has had a very interesting journey 
to to get to this part where he's recently uh, patented and developed his charm. Um, Steve, why don't you just give us a a little bit of the runway and um, and your your story, what led to creating charm and uh, kind of like your why behind it, why you're doing uh, this really pivotal, uh, important work. Of course, and I'll start off by saying thanks, Evan, for this opportunity. And Scarlett, it's great to be out here and talk with you and to everyone watching while we're all at home. Um, Scarlett, you touched on a lot of good points, uh, importantly, coral, right? And we talked about its importance to the oxygen and its importance to the oceans, but also its importance to us as humans. And a little bit about my career. I'm not a marine biologist. I'm an engineer. I graduated from MIT and did mechanical and nuclear, two things that are not related to coral reefs, so I thought. But when I was graduating about four years ago, I kept seeing the reef having its worst bleaching event. And I was like, damn, is there anything I can do? I'm not a biologist, but I'm an engineer. Like, There's got to be something I can do. And so I just set off on a journey to figure out what biologists are doing and if I could somehow help. I have a unique set of skills. And, and that journey actually took a turn and I got a job at NASA doing similar stuff, building satellites for people like Scarlett to look down at the reef and collect information. But I hit this point of, not realization, but like I, I saw the reef every time I'd go to, to, to scuba dive back home in Australia or in Mexico or all over the world. I would see the reef deteriorating and no matter how much information we would gather from our satellites and from our scientists, it still was just information telling us what we could see was the reefs were in trouble, the reefs were degrading and we were threatened. And so it set me off on this question, what could we do to actually solve this problem? And in that need finding and asking around, I talked to many biologists to see where they had a lot of their their biggest pitfalls. What were some things that were really troublesome for them? And in particular, um, according to research, this is gonna surprise you guys, but it takes about 4,000 hours of tedious labor of scientists, like smart guys and girls, going from coral to coral to clean them and to feed them. 4,000 hours to take care of about 10,000 corals. And if we're thinking of about the scale of which we need to restore our reefs, the Great Barrier Reef is what well, we're thinking about 100,000 a day. So that's a lot of manual labor, doing simple repetitive tasks that are well within the, round, the boundaries of machine automation. And uh, a couple of farmers had mentioned the usefulness of a, a computer robot that could do those tasks so that they could focus on the other important stuff like saving our reefs. So what this charm robot does, and I can run downstairs and show you guys before the light goes down. Would you care for a small demo? Please. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Just bear with me. I'll talk about it for a quick sec, actually. And you got to see the lovely studio of my home. Where the magic happens. <laughs> um, in another timeline, another universe, I think the Thousand Mermaids group and I would be um would be together in mexico talking about the coral on stage but now we're at home um so here behind me can you guys see that yes amazing can everyone see yeah so as you can see from the name it says charm and it stands for coral husbandry automated raceway machine so typically as you can tell these are coral right here on the, on the top and it's drained of water because as I'm testing, I didn't want to put real coral first, but those are coral molds. And there's water in here as well. Um, so a raceway is where people grow coral. So it's a body of water that we've been using for thousands of years to cultivate organisms or different things. So the water races from one end to the other and we grow the things that we want to grow. So this is, and if people don't know what the concept of husbandry is, Husbandry is the care and cultivation of animals for breeding or, or stock. So it's like you're a husband to these animals. And I'll tell you, growing coral, you really got to be a husband to them. Uh, they're finicky. They're difficult to, gr to grow. You know, they need a lot of attention, which is exactly where this comes in. So if you guys see it, it's just like any, any machine that you'd have on a, a 3D printer or like a robotic farming. But the cool thing about this is see here this tool tip is just a magnet 
and this one is specific for, for providing food to the coral, but I can have about 10 different tool tips and they connect magnetically. So we can use different types of feed in and out water, air or machines to cut coral. And if everybody here has been cut, I'm sure everyone has gone through that at some point, you activate a healing process and your body will grow. We get scabs and scar tissue and we actually grow faster than we typically grow skin if when we're healing. And the coral is the same way. So if you fragment a coral like this, you see that little fragment there? Mm -hmm. So this fragment came from a larger colony, this guy. Hmm. And what science has shown us recently, actually from the state of Florida was, if you fragment coral, you'll get it to activate a healing process. And this healing process, coral are able to asexually grow their skin back over the, the hurt part, just like we do. But in this process, they found that they're growing 26 to 50 times their natural growth speed. So what that means is in half a year, we could grow a coral reef to the size of a 25 year old reef. We could really actually have scientific base to say, we have a chance here. We have really good hope to grow coral fast enough. And when we have big bleaching events or mass die off events, we'll have enough coral in stock ready to be transplanted back to the reef. And there are a lot of different benefits to this that we, we have yet to figure out. But the first step was to build it and the second step is to use it. So we've done step one. And the hope is that anybody here uh, who's interested in growing coral or helping with the design or the development of this charm, uh, I invite you guys to come and help us because we need all the help we can get. Amazing. And great explanation even for those of us that aren't scientists or marine biologists um, that you're you know really on the cutting edge of of something magical um and as Stephen was explaining um you know it could speed up the process of corals regrowing it it takes 80 to 100 or more years for corals to reach their sexual matur maturity so if we're able to speed that process up to literally be less than a year potentially or one to two years um while we're in this ticking time clock in this race unfortunately against there's disease effects that are plaguing the reefs. There's bleaching effects that are plaguing the reefs. There's obvious climate change effects and changes in the temperature and the, and the water that are plaguing the reefs. So all of these solutions, um, any new solution uh, is, is definitely welcomed by the science community, by the coral reef community. Uh, there's one solution I left out and I apologize, I kind of rushed into it. Um, if you didn't know who I am, uh, my name is Evan Snow. And I'm the executive director of the Thousand Mermaids Artificial Reef Project, which you might be able to see a little bit of behind me on the screen here. I'm sure most of you know, but uh, my friends Ernest and Sierra, two sculptors and artists, came up with a, a, a project where they body casted a, a local person in the form of a mermaid for a gentleman that owned a yacht. By the time they went to deliver it, the guy said, I have bad news, I lost my business, I lost my boat, I lost my wife. Uh, true South Florida scammer. He went to federal prison. Uh, my buddy Ernest famously said to him, well, what do you want me to do with the sculpture? The gentleman said, I don't care. Throw it in the ocean. And that's when the aha moment uh, went off in Ernest's brain, which led to getting with the county, which led to getting with Army Corps of Engineers, which fortunately led to us getting with one of the most knowledgeable, resourceful, and experienced reef builders, uh, Chris O'Hare, up in Boynton Beach of Reef Cells, who's previously done Many noteworthy reefs, uh, Andrew Red Harris Reef, Phil Foster Snorkel Trail Park, uh, all of these up in Palm Beach County, Florida. Um, we're on the cutting edge of something very exciting, which has a lot of synergies with, with Stephen and Charm, where uh, our reef builder, uh, taking insight from uh, one of the gentlemen who's considered the inventor or the godfather of this coral fragging, super coral uh, initiative, Dr. David Vaughn, uh, Chris, has uh, created a bunch of patents to be incorporated directly onto our reefs where we're able to take these little baby corals, these fragmented corals or micro fragmented corals, take them from the reef with permits, all safely tracked, secured, take them in the lab, cut them up into little baby pieces, micro fragments, literally centimeters big, um, and then 
as Stephen previously uh, mentioned, when they're out planted back into the wild, they're proven to regrow up to 25 or 50 times faster, can reach sexual maturity maybe in one to two years versus 80 or 100 years or even longer. So um, that's a little bit of what the Thousand Mermaids Project is working on in terms of new innovations, um, using art as a problem solver, um, you know, connecting that human connection from the uh, from a, a form of a body, from a body cast down into the ocean on an artificial reef. And one of the things we like to raise awareness of through this project is, you know, hopefully as we work to raise more people's awareness about single use plastic alternatives and, and sustainability, hopefully people, more people won't put plastic on their boat and hopefully not put plastic in the ocean. So these are some of the, the initiatives through Charm through SCG uh, 14, Life Below Water, um, through the Thousand Mermaid Project that we're looking to share. One of the other initiatives that we're looking to share tonight uh, after this panel discussion is done is one of the aha moments for myself and for a lot of people on our team was watching the Chasing Coral documentary, which we put a virtual watch party to show afterwards, uh, which Scarlett linked in the comments at 8 p.m. Um, if you haven't watched it before, it really is eye-opening. They, uh, they outline everything, um, uh, the situation plaguing the coral reefs, innovative solutions to solve it, how they're monitoring it. So you can find that um, on Netflix after the panel discussion is over. But before we end the panel discussion, um, Scarlett, I want to, uh, I always like to ask this question to draw the, the human connection to it. Um, you could be doing a million other things in the world right now. What is your why, personally, behind you know, doing the work that you're doing and working to help save the reefs and life below water. Oh, you're on mute. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much, um, I, I, Evan, for, for having that discussion as well. Um, so the SDG, which is Sustainable Development Goal 14, has targeted goals to help protect the ocean. In this matter, what is the call for action to help the coral reef. What can I do as an individual who cares about the coral reef but don't understand how, what can I be part of? The best way to really to heal the call for ASHA is to engage yourself. Be proactive. Um, do your research, get yourself involved, educate others, and also be mindful of what you can also um, uh, help with the cause. Don't leave it up to the scientists to um, be able to resolve this. This is a global involvement. Everybody needs to be part of the call for action to be able to support. It could be something very simple as watching Chasing Corals, just to get yourself informed what is the, the, the real cause of it, the, the death of the corals and why should I care? How does that affect me? And remember, any little thing, or I always like to uh, put this little uh, analysis, you might feel like a drop, but combined, we become an ocean. So if you hear the call for action and want to learn more, get yourself engaged and check it out. Now, the SDG, as well as NOAA, provide ample data. In, uh, there's a lot of apps to learn how um, more of the educational side of, um, and I'll be placing that in the link, in the chat room link, uh, how you can get yourself engaged and be part of it. Uh, of this. You don't necessarily have to be a scientist, just just fall in love with, with corals and understand what it is and why it's so important. So hopefully, um, and also get engaged at a thousand mermaids. Please shout out, you know, uh, he, he's a great person to be involved. And as he mentioned before, you know, he's not a scientist um, and yet he was able to hear the call for action. He's done an amazing job here, uh, more so than I would say it, it, others. Um, so really get it, getting that word out. That is my call for action. Amen. I appreciate it. I'd like that. to piggyback on that if, if I can. Um, Ms. Scarlett, you mentioned, well, first off, the, the amazing stuff that Thousand Mermaids has been doing. And I, I love this project that they've been, been working on for so many years now because it really does tie in the art and the science. You know, you're, you're creating these concrete sculptures, but they're safe for the ocean. They're creating habitat for tons of different life. And this is the food chain we have to respect. But what's so, what's so wonderful about it is it's, 
you're able to create molds of people, you can be a part of it. And like, like we had said before, you don't have to be a marine biologist. You could be a, a caster or an artist or a politician or an educator. Like this is gonna take a community effort and an understanding that our community as people, whether we live on the coast or we live inland, we are so connected and rely, relying, what is the right word? Relying on the ocean. And to do your part in that oceanic community and to understand your role, it comes from within. No one's gonna tell you what you have to do. This is the time for us to think about, you know, like how do we increase the amount of life on this earth? We're, we're in a troublesome spot right now. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it, but this is the perfect time right now with the world stopping from quarantine. We've proven to ourselves that we can make rapid change when we want to. We can live in a world that we wanna see if we focus on that. And so now that we've proven we can make this change rapidly, how do you anticipate your change will be if and when we reemerge? I like to, you know, think about all the good things we can do, but it starts from inside your home. You know, how do you make your own space inviting to the animals that our world re requires? How do you invite those animals, put out bird food, you know, plant a you know, garden for the bees? Those little things that you, you might not know now, but if you ask what you can do, there's a lot of people will come out and help you make a difference. Amen. And there's, there's so many ways you can get involved, and get involved, as Carla mentioned. Every drop creates a pool, creates an ocean, and, and every little bit literally does help. Uh, from the Thousand Mermaids perspective, our call to action, all we could ever hope for is a like or a follow on social media, to tell a friend to tell a friend, or to share something about the project, uh, which we really appreciate all of you guys that have tuned in pretty much did. Uh, so we, we genuinely appreciate that. Um, I mean, if you have the ability, $20 to, to buy a t-shirt off of our website, we're a 501c3 nonprofit, all of the proceeds goes directly back into the project to help with our operating budget and running the website and, you know, uh, printing marketing materials and all the things that we need to do as a nonprofit to grow our project. Um, aside from being casted uh, as an individual, which we do have a donation option for somebody to do to be one of the Thousand Mermaids, we have a phenomenal citizen science program. Uh, headed up by our education coordinator who's on the call, Stacy Brown, um, where Stacy, uh, mother of triplets, uh, works with middle school and high school students to help get them certified in scuba diving uh, to be one of our coral rangers so that they, in the future, can help us literally hands-on on the reef, be it out planting the coral fragments from the lab directly onto the reef, helping us monitor the reef, which is a super important part to see hopefully not the degradation of the reef but hopefully as the reefs regenerate and regrow we need people literally to be underwater monitoring them unless we get the cameras that you're going to see in this chasing coral documentary in a few minutes uh that cost thousands of dollars um but there's so many ways you can get involved don't hesitate to reach out to uh me uh at evanson 13 at 1000 mermaids www.1000mermaids.com um, Scarlett, where can they uh, find you, social medias, email, website? Uh, thank you. So for me, um, if you go on Facebook, tap in STG4T, uh, Life Below Water. Uh, I'm actually sending a direct link. Um, so if you have any questions, I'm actually typing my email as well. I'm readily available in those areas in the chat group. So it's STG number 14, Life Below Water. Um, so definitely we can help you get this connection, how to become a citizen science, I'm the personal point of contact in order to get um, engaged, everything from, um, you know, it's, it's funny because that's one of the things that uh, NOAA does provide is, is funding to be uh, to everything from getting um, certified, uh, especially if you're a minority. Uh, there's a lot of funds out there to help support these type of initiatives. Um, and also, um, if you want to become a citizen scientist and learn more about it, um, you're welcome to reach me um, afterwards, and I'll send you a link of all the resources out there available. Um, and this is great for all ages. I don't think because it, it works as young as 10 to 90-year-olds. Um, we get all types of volunteers to help with these type of initiatives. Um, so we just want to get you out there and, and be part of the solution. Steve, uh, where can they find you on uh, the interwebs? 
<laughs> well, I would definitely direct people to our website, which is www.beyondcoral.com. Um, you can generally find us on, on social media at Beyond Coral. And um, a lot of our, our people are all over the world. We're based out of Tulum. We have some people in Florida, D.C., Vancouver, Colorado. You know, we've got people from all over. So we really encourage people to reach out. There's, there's so many opportunities to be involved. And, uh, you know, we're in including more people every day. Amen. And um, we're all very... Um humble, uh, grateful, uh, grounded, you know, individuals, although Stephen, you know, MIT grad, you know, uh, worked for NASA and all that, you know, he's, he's approachable, <laughs> he's approachable, you know, you can reach out to him, you can reach out to us. We have, <laughs> we, uh, we have people that have got involved, um, you know, in so many different capacities, if they had marine biology backgrounds or not, our uh, president of our board right now, uh, Megan Romine, you know, she's a passionate uh, ocean lover and spearfisher. Um, and she's very big on sustainable fishing and um, fell in love with our project and got involved and, and I was helping. So help comes in so many different forms um, that you'll never know unless you reach out. So hopefully you will reach out. Hopefully you follow us all along on social media. Hopefully if you haven't watched it yet, you'll tune in to Chasing Coral shortly after this. It's an absolutely phenomenal documentary on Netflix. Before we get to that, we do have a few more minutes. Um, we did have a few questions um, and I'll throw it to our panel here. Uh, Felisa asked, incorporating new healthy corals into a bleached area, would the, would the new corals become bleached too? Well, there's a yes and no. The, the, the simple yes would be if the water is still too acidic or, or really it's temperature, um, you're putting coral into an environment that's just not conducive to, to healthy coral. But typically, those hot blobs of water that cause bleaching events, uh, they stick around for a number of weeks, but they go away, right? The, the problem is that they're getting sick for about a month or even longer than two weeks, and that's when they bleach and they die. But it's the perfect time to have coral ready to transplant. If you think of coral reefs as um, like apartments, and when the coral, those, all those little animals living in a colony, when they die, they've, they've their skin dies, but their skeleton remains. And that skeleton is, is amazing habitat for new coral to grow upon. Coral grow really well over dead coral. That's something we know. And the issue is that you have to do it within a certain period of time. Otherwise, we we fall risk to letting the, the algae and the slime start growing over all that. And coral are always competing with algae for real estate. It's like us when we cut down trees to build our home. We need to have our homes, but if there's too many trees, like you don't have any space. So by putting coral out there within a certain short period of time, the coral can do what they call reskinning, because the only living part of a coral is its skin. And like Frankenstein, we could stitch back up a denuded reef with living coral, and they will reskin that dead reef. So long as the water quality, I'll say this is right. still conducive to healthy coral. That's the number one thing is, is healthy water and clean water. Amen. And that's and important for us too. And thankfully the planet's getting a little bit of a break right now. Um, Felisa, uh, thank you for asking the question. Um, yeah, and that's one thing that we really can't lose sight of. All of these initiatives, unfortunately, might be for not if conditions don't improve, if the water, water temperatures hopefully don't continue rising. Um, it doesn't matter what we put out there. So it really is important to raise awareness, to get people to think about the little incremental changes that they can make, bringing a reusable bag to the, to the grocery store, to the supermarket versus more plastic, using a reusable water bottle like this thousand mermaids one right here. Um, and, and little things that you can do to make incremental changes to offset and minimize your carbon footprint. Um, I know Scarlett, you're a big sustainability uh, <laughs> Ambassador, any other um, steps or things or, or little things that you would recommend for people that they can do to make a change? Yeah, absolutely. Um, refuse, reuse. Um, it used to be recycle, but uh, repurpose. So that's something that you want to be mindful as uh, globalization and overpopulation becomes increasingly. Um, remember those three R's. So I'm going to write those down as well. Um, you know, be mindful as well. It, uh, use reef safe sunblock as well. So when you're out there, 
I'm enjoying being mindful. Um, corals are animals and you know, they don't like to be swamped by chemicals, um, nor do anybody else, you know, think about yourself, you know, if, if somebody came and put all this chemical around your house, you would not like it. And of course that uh, has affect a lot of the coral reefs. Be mindful there, there are animals, you know, unfortunately corals cannot move, but just be mindful. Um, they don't like to be touched either because we secrete oil. So they're nice to observe, but you know, it, it's best not to touch them. Amen. And you, you correct. And you should have permits and, and uh, permission and, and, and uh, a lot of things in place to touch them. And um, just, you know, for those, once again, because this is so out of sight, out of sight, out of mind, there's a couple uh, things I, I like to just kind of correlate for people um, aside from uh, the thousands of species of fish that rely on the reef. Um, coral reefs in Southeast Florida alone are a seven billion dollar, they create seven billion dollar economic impact that supports upwards of potentially 70,000 jobs. Think of all the sport fishing captains, the dive captains, the dive shops. There's so many people in, in this industry that are, if they're directly related to the reef or indirectly related to the reef, potentially going to lose their way of life, their income, their business. If and when these reefs die, and, and nobody really likes to hear this or talk about this, but if the reefs die, and the reefs are the Amazon of the ocean, they provide oxygen to the lungs, well, nobody wants to sail on a dead planet. Nobody wants to fish on a dead planet. We potentially aren't going to have the largest boat show in the world anymore in Fort Lauderdale. We might not be the yachting capital of the world anymore in Fort Lauderdale. So while there's a $7 billion economic impact directly tied to the coral reefs, what about all the other benefits, Fort Lauderdale, I live in Fort Lauderdale, not being as sexy of a destination anymore. People don't want a vacation here to go to the beach. They'd rather go to Tulum. They'd rather go to other places with, with healthier reefs, with healthier beaches. So when you really start to think about it, and as I mentioned, as I'll continue to mention, unfortunately, it's out of sight, out of sight for so, out of sight, out of mind for so many people. Um, these little animals and, and um, uh, these little these little creatures that cover 1% of the sea floor provide habitat for 25% of the fish in the sea. It means so much to our way of life and it's unfortunate just because we can't see them every day unless we dive that we you know shouldn't care about them and, and shouldn't give them the attention that they deserve. You touched on a lot of really good points, Evan, and I'd just like to chime in one Please. really crucial role that coral reefs play that we haven't mentioned, and, and that's of coastal protection. Yes. Now, you talked about specifically the boats, which this can tie into, but um, a coral reef crest produces wave energy by 94% on average. 94%. So that means without those corals, that big, you know, protection wall that we don't see invisible but it is there when that wall is gone those storms and those hurricanes when they come through we will feel the power of that water and those waves and for anybody that doesn't quite respect the ocean or understand the power of water it, it's it's a fright and it's really you know really important that, that we keep coral alive not just because they're pretty they are aesthetically gorgeous but our the our protection depends on it correct great point um it also could help mitigate against beach renourishment. And, you know, we put $100 million worth of sand back on the beach every year in the state of Florida alone. What if there is not $100 million worth of sand to continue putting back on the beach? And what if a living, healthy, cool reef system can act as that first line of defense and that first barrier to help mitigate the storms, waves, and, and the energy so that we don't have to keep putting this extensive amount of sand back on the beach? So there's so many benefits. There's so many things that the corals relate to. We could be here all night, um, but I definitely um, want to give you guys an opportunity to log on to the Netflix watch party, which Scarlett dropped in the chat, which is in the Facebook event page. We can drop it in the chat again. Um, it's on Netflix, Chasing Coral. Pull it up. Um, hopefully, if you haven't seen it before, it resonates with you. If it's an aha moment or not, um, if you have any questions, uh, well, there's a chat in the Netflix watch party. Put them in there. 
don't hesitate to reach out to myself. I'm Evan Snow, Stephen Rodan, Scott Arana. Thank you, everybody on the team that joined. Stacy, Megan, Mermaid Charlotte, um, my parents, everybody else in between. And um, we're when we do get back to normal, we're going to have plenty of events and opportunities for you guys to meet us, get involved, get hands-on. Uh, we are going to have a, a fundraising dinner at uh, Casa de Angels in Fort Lauderdale. We're going to get a chance to meet and dine with the team very intimately. It's only going to be like 50 people. Um, we're also going to have a hands-on event, all things considered, at a reef builders facility in Boynton Beach, uh, where you'll be able to see the multiple steps of the process. We'll do a live casting that day, so you'll see the first step in the process. You'll see some of the other steps in between, and then Chris has the finished products of some of the reefs that we'll be putting in the ocean in the future. If you know an individual that like to have their legacy live forever under the sea floor, a family, a company, or a foundation, please don't hesitate to reach out. We can make a reef and a company's likeness or logo and an individual's likeness or logo or whatever the case may be. Um, we're working on very exciting projects, City of Hollywood, Dania, Palm Beach County, Hard Rock, Elbow Room, uh, a lot of big players. Um, so you never know, just passing this along to somebody that might want to help save the reefs, have their legacy live forever in the sea floor and support a local nonprofit, you know, you might actually be one of the keys. So you never know unless you uh, try. So thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, and last and thing for us. On behalf of a nonprofit, every little bit counts. So just let me echo what Evan's saying. Please. Even if it's five bucks or a share with your friends. Um, you know, you guys wouldn't be here unless the word got around. So thanks for coming. But like, please share the Thousand Mermaids. It's sticky. It's a really sticky topic. People love it. And I do too. Amen. So, and we appreciate your support, okay. Steve. Uh, and as Stacy mentioned in the chat, uh, for our citizen science program, if you know a middle school, high school student um, that would like to uh, get involved, either get certified and then potentially help us hands-on with the outplanting, monitoring, or otherwise. And we do other bunch of events as well for the kids. Um, education at 1000mermaids.com uh, is the email address. We need adults as well. Thank you very much. And uh, at, uh, coming up, we have some great webinar classes on Bleach Watch and uh, Fish ID program, uh, which you can find on our Facebook event page. Um, and we'll continue to share those on our social media. And... I want to thank you guys very much for joining us tonight. We'll see you when we get back to normal. Stay safe. Stay socially distant. Stay charming. Amen. <laughs> <laughs>